Good afternoon to all of you. Today, we come to the final reflection in our series for our patronal festival. And today, Deacon Nicholas Small Warner, who is our assistant curate, is the one privileged and chosen to give the final lecture to be a young Anakin, a personal perspective. Deacon Nicholas was brought up in the church. He was a very active member at Christ Church. And so he brings with us a certain wealth of knowledge and information of what it means to be a member of the Anglican Church. And so it is my pleasure and privilege to invite the Reverend Nicholas Bard Warner to give the final lecture in this series. Deacon Nicholas. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would first like to thank Canon Isaacs for this opportunity. I actually kind of jumped at the introduction just now when, when you said chosen. Um, I didn't think it was that deep, but I guess if I'm chosen, I pray that I'll be able to deliver to you all um, a lecture that you will find inspiring in terms of my experiences as an Anglican. I would like to first say that, as Kenna has said, this is the last day for this, in this series, and as I would have spoken before in giving thanks to the others who would have gone before me, there is a level of diversity that we would have seen coming out in these sessions. Each person would have had their own experiences in their own areas, whether here or abroad, and it gives us a viewpoint of what others see and what others experience that we might be able to identify with in our own experiences. So maybe you will find something in mind today that might be able to in some way inspire you on, on your journey. I am by no means an exception, as I said, to the ones who have gone before. And, well, the only exception really would be that you can say that I, I guess I am, I am a little younger than the ones who have gone before me. So my perspective may be slightly different, but all the same, it is still advantageous. We know well enough now that we have heard about what it means to be an Anglican in its definition. And it simply means for us being an affiliate of the Church of England. So by virtue of our history, we are Anglicans. But if I had to put this in my own words, in our own Caribbean context, and what most of us probably would have heard people say before, or, or you know, we, we, we overhear persons saying from time to time, is that if we think of Anglicanism in our own context, we will hear such words as traditional, old, and perhaps for some, especially those who are younger, maybe in my age group are younger than I am, some persons might think that you know, our Anglicanism where we come from, it has spent its time. So it can seem for some out of touch with reality and with our culture. But if I had to use my own experience to reel that in, and I know it's not just me, but there are other persons who would have had similar experiences my age, I will start with how I became an Anglican. And as Canon said, I would have been in church for several years, well, since I was born. And I want to start here first because 
My first experience, particularly at St. Mary, as I had alluded to kind of Isaacs when I first came here about two months ago, was a funeral that I attended, and it was actually my grandmother's funeral, who was actually buried just opposite the church by the wall um, facing the west door. And every time it came to this church, but I didn't, I didn't come very often, but any time it came to this church, I would remember that funeral. And with the help of some pictures that I found recently, well, I knew they were there, but I looked back at the pictures and I was actually able to find the burial, the burial spot of my grandmother. And she died when I was about three or four years old, but I still remember the funeral. And there's one hymn that I would always, that will always bring back up that memory for me, Blessed Assurance. And the reason is that it was, out of everything that, that happened on that day, that's the only hymn that I recall from the actual burial itself. And every time I hear that, I remember St. Mary's and I remember the time when I came here for my grandmother's funeral. But I was born in, not in Christchurch as most persons might think, but I was actually born in St. Michael. My family, both sides, my mother's family and my father's family is from St. Michael. Very close, actually. My mother's family was from Queen Victoria Road, and then they moved to Hall's Land, where my grandmother still resides to this day. And my father's family was in Garden Land. And out of that, well, came me and my sister. And we both grew up Anglican. Funny enough, we could actually have been Methodists because in experiencing having to go through the situation with my dad who passed last year. I found out that my dad and all his siblings were actually baptized at Bethel Methodist just up the road. So for some reason, I kept to the Anglican side. My mom took us to the Anglican, well, Christ Church, Paris Church. We moved to Christ Church when it was about a year old. And that's where I had been ever since, since well, before I went to Codrington College three years ago. Incidentally, I was not baptized at Christ Church Parish Church, but like four other presenters before, I was actually baptized at All Souls. So I came out of All Souls. I don't know if Kenner, I don't think Kenner actually knew what he did when he put all these presenters together, but five out of the six, all of us came from All Souls, and I found it quite interesting. I didn't, spend, I didn't spend very long there, as I would have told you, we moved to Christ Church when it was about a year old. But I still had connections and still do have connections at All Souls Church. My family still worships there, my aunts, some of my aunts and uncles, and I have cousins there as well. And from time to time, I would meet persons going around who would tell me, oh, they know my family because they are from All Souls. And they know me from the time I was a baby. And I can tell you that some of them I know, and to be honest, some, some of them I, I really don't know, but you know, it, it, that's, that's the nature of the story. So I still have ties to All Souls, even though I did not actually worship at All Souls. When I started going to church at Christ Church, Paris Church, again, I was there from the time we moved to Christ Church, um, there were many activities that I would have been involved in. Growing up, you had Sunday school, and just after, but I didn't spend a lot of time in Sunday school, to be honest. I left Sunday school when I was about 10 years old, and I was drafted into the choir. I spent about two or three years in the choir before I joined the servers, and I was in the service guild up until 2018 when I left to go to Codgerton College. Being at Christ Church also, I would have been engaged in some youth activities. Um, there was a youth group that we had. As I said, we had the servers. And there would also have been a re-energizing of what we would have called our dance ministry. And I also would have been involved in that over the last maybe 10 years or so. So that is my experience with the Anglican Church. I just want to give 
a bit on the structure of this, what we call the Anglican Church, what is our tradition. And it has been touched on before in one of the other presentations. But our Anglican Church is an Anglican communion. That is what is, is called the Anglican communion. And this communion is made up of, right now it is 41 provinces. And these provinces are all over the world. And each province, as you might know, is made up of different um, countries or different dioceses, I should say. And then the dioceses are made up of different parishes. So for example, the Diocese of Barbados, we have about between 46 to 52 churches or parishes, and these parishes make up our diocese. Our diocese is a part of the church in the province of the West Indies, which is made up of eight dioceses. And our province is one of the 41 provinces making up the Anglican Communion. And in our communion, we have what is called the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, unlike the Pope in the Catholic Church, is considered the first among equals. Primus into Paris, the first among equals. So he's our spiritual leader. And we don't consider him our absolute leader but he's a spiritual leader, what we call the first among the leaders of the Anglican Church. So all the other archbishops and bishops of the communion. And for him, he leads the three instruments of the communion. The Lambeth Conference, which is held approximately every 10 years. The Primates Meeting, which is a meeting of the chief archbishops or presiding bishops moderators and chief pastors across the provinces, and the Anglican Consultative Council, which is held approximately every three years, and that one also includes members of the laity from across, across the communion. Now, as I talk about, go through my experiences now, I, I want to bring in here uh, an author that I met at Codgerton College in one of our courses, Christian Education. And her name is Maria Harris. Now, Maria Harris was not an Anglican. She was actually a liberal Catholic. But in her book, Fashion Me a People, she explores Christian education. And she highlights five forms of being a Christian for the curriculum that she was talking about. And these forms are based on Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 40, and 44 to 47. She gave them in the Greek, and I will give you the English. The first one is kerygma, which is proclaiming the word of Jesus' resurrection. The second one, liturgia, which means worship. The third one, koinonia, which is fellowship or community. The fourth one, didache, which is teaching. And the fifth one, diakonia, which is service, from where we get the word deacon. So my perspective going on from here will be on being an Anglican will be shaped by these five forms. The passage that I spoke about just now, Acts chapter two, verses 42 and 44 to 47 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. So she used this to form her to create her forms for education curriculum of Christian teaching. The first one I will look at then is kerygma, meaning proclaiming the gospel. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship will be an example of this. For us as Anglicans, we believe that the Bible remains the primary authority for us and is used daily in our prayer and our worship. We consider the word of God, our incarnate Lord, who is risen to be our savior and redeemer of the world, 
And as Anglicans, we continually preach his resurrection and promise to us and believe his promise to us as heirs to the eternal kingdom. And when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ, into the Lord's family. And from there, we are nurtured in a community with fellow believers. We strive to proclaim this gospel in our own lives and experiences, our faith in Jesus Christ. And personally, you know, for me, I know that growing in faith happened a lot through my experiences. And if I can go back to the time that I was in school, particularly secondary school, I don't know about other persons, but for me, my experience at school was one where you didn't really speak a lot about church. Honestly, you didn't really speak a lot about church. Yes, you, you had assembly on mornings, you had hymns, and you had prayers, but other than that, you didn't really speak a lot about church. So it was kind of difficult to actually find persons that you can actually engage with about. And it's not to say that they weren't persons, it's just that you didn't know who they were. If they were Anglican, if they were Methodist, if they were Pentecostal, because it seemed like a different environment altogether. And at that age, nobody didn't really, you know, talking about where you went to church and who you, where you're going to and that type of stuff. So it wasn't very easy to actually bring up topics about church at, at school. But I would have to say it became easier as my experiences came along. I, after school, I would have gone to Barbados Community College. I did, at the surprise of many, I did actually an associate degree in fashion design. If I told you 10 years ago, I would not have been able to say that. I did not say 10 years ago, but you are able to accept your experiences as you go along. And the reason why is because at that time, especially for a male, it was not really accepted, so to speak, that males actually went to do certain stuff as fashion design. I was considered, I considered myself artistic. I did art at CXC. I wanted to do something else in art, but because I was so enamored with illustration, especially drawing people, that is why I went into fashion design. And after that, I went into teaching. I started teaching at 21, and I taught for about eight years before I went into Cardinal College. And that experience for me was, it was exciting at first when I first went, but to be honest, I would have to say within the first few weeks, I got a rude awakening. And it is there that I realized generations are different. Even though me saying that, you know, it sounds, it sounds weird because at my age, you would think, well, you young, you know, so for you to say generations are different seems strange. But yes, generations are different. Even five years from me, generations are different. So having to teach persons at that time that were almost 10 years younger than I am, it was kind of strange. It was, it was weird and it was challenging. But I lasted eight years. And through that, and through my experience before that, I recognized that my faith was what was able to get me through those particularly stressful days. And they were stressful days. But even through all of that, I continued to go to church and go and do what I did. I served at the altar. I continued to do youth work and continue to do dancing as well. So I said that to say that even in our experiences, we may not have to say something, but even when we are doing we are worshiping. We are proclaiming the gospel. The second one is liturgia, prayer or worship. Verse 42, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And these again is what Maria Harris would have used to create her forms. From this word, we get that the English word, we get that English word that we know as, as liturgy which describes a set, of, a set pattern for worship. And for us, this is evidence in our Book of Common Prayer, which in itself has a rich history, beginning with the first publication around 1549 by Thomas Cranmer, and saw some revisions throughout time where even now we 
in the Church of the Province of the West Indies, we have our own Book of Common Prayer. And while it may vary in some instances across the provinces, it is usually noted that the advantage our liturgy has is that one can visit any type of country across the province. And even though there are differences, you will still be able to follow along the liturgy quite well. So you might hear a person saying, I've been to some country in Africa, or I've been to England, I've been to some um, country in Europe. You may not understand the language, but you may be able, you're going to be able to follow what is going on because there are, very, there, there are similarities between what other persons across the communion do and what we do. There are variations, yes, but I think the advantage that we have as the Anglican communion is that even if we don't understand the language, we are still able to follow along in the liturgy. For me, our worship, I would describe as reflective, and in some cases, solemn, but it also has room for contemporary expression. And Father Bernard Bean would have alluded to this in the first lecture a few weeks ago. We have a tradition where we use hymns, we use psalms, not that other denominations don't use them. We use the organ a lot. And that is a tradition for us, and it is something that we love. But I feel also that we are open to other forms of worship. We are open to other contemporary styles. And I think for us it's an advantage where we can have both coming together. You don't have to do them at the same time. But when you have that variation and that variety, it lends to, again, the diversity of who we are as a people. The third one, koinonia, or community, or fellowship. Verse 44, all who believed were, gathered, were together and had all things in common. We are a church which operates and celebrates the function of our community, a coming together of us like-minded individuals for the purpose of prayer and worship, but it's also for us to enjoy fellowship, forming great bonds between members. Each of our parishes is a community in itself, functioning in a specific geographical area. This quality of community and fellowship, of course for me, was born out of my experience first at Christ Church Parish Church. And at church, you find community, you, I would have found community and fellowship first within the Sunday school, but then you're also a member of the entire congregation. So you have fellowship with persons who are your age, but then you also get to share fellowship with persons who are older or even younger than you. In my experience at Christ Church, the number of years that I was there, I can say that they would have had many persons that would have passed through since I was there, young and old. And yes, persons, we have to acknowledge that persons would leave for various reasons. They're their reasons, you know, but the fellowship and the community continues even though persons would, have, would leave for whatever reasons to go wherever they go and other persons come in. So the benefit is that you get, you, you get communion and fellowship with persons whether they are there or not. And I would have to say as well that even if persons left the church, you still have fellowship with them or community with them, even though it may not be as frequent as you used to do before. I still have relationships with persons that may not have been at church for a little while, especially during this pandemic. And it is vital to me because you're still able to connect with persons that you wouldn't have seen, and they still know that you know, there's somebody that still cares about them even though they're not there. And this is either if they are at church, or maybe they, well, sorry, this is either if they left church, or even if they moved to another denomination or another church. But in my experience, it wasn't only about Christ Church, Paris Church. I think community for me was built a lot 
when I realized that I could go to other churches. And when I started going as a server to other festivals, festivals for me brought out a lot of what fellowship and community was, especially because at most of our festivals, unfortunately, we can't take part in them now, but when we used to have the festivals that we used to have, you would find that there are certain groups that would actually be invited on certain nights. And if I speak only of the servers, I can tell you that for the last maybe five to 10 years, I would have formed a lot of relationships with persons from other parishes that if you didn't go before, you would not, as a young person, realize, well, we are not the only persons doing this. There are other persons out there in other parishes who are doing the same thing, and there are persons who are your same age. So I think for young people especially, going to festivals was a high, was a high note. You got to meet persons of your same age, and then that is where you realize, well, hey, I went to school with this person, or I know this person from this place that you didn't know before. And that is where, for me, community really was solidified, because you met persons that did the same things as you, you met persons who were the same age as you, and you were able to form great bonds with persons, even though you may not see them a lot now. But even, even though we're going through this pandemic, I can tell you that I still talk to a lot of those persons who are my friends today that are from other churches, and even some from other denominations, because you would have had persons as well who would have come into the church for the festivals from other denominations. So festivals to me was a highlight of community. And I think that is one of the key points for us as Anglican persons, as Anglicans. The fourth one, but well, before I get to the fourth one, I want to mention three other things that I think community really, where community really came out. In the Christchurch Deanery, I'm not too sure about the other deaneries, but I know in Christchurch Deanery, every year over the last maybe five years or so, given taking out the years of the pandemic, we had a deanery service. And this deanery service was always held out on the outside. And that too was a case where you were able to meet up with persons from different churches in your deanery and you realize that, you know, there's good, there are good things happening within the deanery with persons that are your own age. I know we talk sometimes about, oh, there are not many young people in church, but really and truly, there are a lot of young people in church. We may not see them at a particular time, and we know that, you know, when you reach a certain age, yes, there are persons that might fall off because of one reason or the other, but then there's still a lot of other persons who are in church and doing good things. The second one is the diocesan service. And I will tell you personally, for me, I do miss that service because it was, it was really inspiring and it was really good to see when we all came together from the diocese in one place and we were able to have fellowship, we were able to worship together. And hopefully one day we will be able to get back there. The third one for me would have been provincial youth gathering. Provincial youth gathering is, well, it's typically held almost every three years but the last one would have been in 2016, where I went to Grenada with the team from Barbados. I went as a chaperone. And it gives you an even greater sense of community because then you meet persons from other islands that are your age, some are younger than you, but you come together and you worship and you take part in activities for an entire week. And it causes you to realize, well, hey, we are not the only ones here. We're not the only Anglicans. And there are others around that are doing things in other parishes, in other communities, in other countries. The fourth one is diaconia, service. They will sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. As I said before, sometimes we hear comments, especially at this time, that the church is not doing enough or maybe not doing anything. And you would hear that the church is only looking for money. Service is about responding to the needs of others, including offering pastoral care, particularly during this time. Our church, the Anglican Church, has continued to do this daily. 
I think the issue is that some persons maybe not visibly see it, so they assume that it isn't happening. But it is happening. God is still at work and he's working through us. Many of our churches have social outreach committees, including here at St. Mary's. Sometimes you will hear about the deacon's cupboard. And reaching out even to our friends and fellow congregants is providing service to others. As Anglicans, we also recognize that our service is also interrelated to the various fields that we are a part of. So if you are a doctor, if you are a nurse, if you are a teacher, if you are a sales executive, whatever you are, as an Anglican, you are still providing a service in whatever field you are. And the fifth one is Didache, which is teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. This was first mentioned a few weeks ago by Father Bernard Bean, and it was also brought up by Brother Adrian Elcock. Education has been and continues to be a primary factor in the life of our Anglican communion. As Brother Adrian said, we ensure that our clergy is well educated and also take opportunities for a continuing education. But this is not only limited to clergy, but is also offered to laity as well. You can actually go and do a diploma in in pastoral studies at Cudgelton College. You can, you can register at University of the West Indies to do the Bachelor of Arts degree in theology. You don't have to be a member of clergy to do that. But one of the things for me growing up that really showed teaching, we know of Sunday school, yes, and we know about Bible study, but I think one of my turning points as an Anglican came a few years ago with the introduction of the Anglican studies. And there is where I realized I needed to know more about my faith. The first time I went to Anglican studies, it was just after, I think, either the first or the second diocesan service, either 2014 or 2015. And I remember sitting in the first lecture that night. And after the lecture, I was so, I was so excited because I didn't know much of this stuff about who we were. And it led me to find out more about what I was doing, more research about what we were doing as Anglicans. And I guess maybe in an indirect way, that is what led me to College and College. That wasn't the only thing, but it was one of the primary things. So our teaching is also a tradition that we hold that we should be proud of. So to end off, I would just like to say being an Anglican involves all of these things, prayer, worship, proclamation of the gospel, community or fellowship, teaching and service. If you look closely, all of these are bound up in our communion's five marks of mission, to proclaim the gospel, to teach, baptize and nurture new believers, to respond to human need by loving service, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation, and to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Those are the five marks of mission of the Anglican Communion. Our Anglicanism then is a vital part of the puzzle that we call Christianity and the Christian family. We express our faith and develop our spirituality from a structured liturgy, which maybe some others may find limiting, but for us is a tool that collects us all together around the world. I pray that you would have found something inspiring in my presentation today of my experience as an Anglican, well, being a young Anglican, and that it would serve you well in your journey. Thank you. Let me express our thanks and gratitude to the Reverend Nicholas Small Warner for sharing with us his perspective of what it means for him to be a member of the Anglican Church. Over the past five weeks, different persons have brought their perspective and this speaks of the variety that is an essential part 
of Anglicanism. In the in our church, there is no one description of what it means to be an Anglican or to practice Anglicanism. And so I hope that over the past weeks, the various presentations have helped us to appreciate our church, its ministry, and its worship. And we pray God to bless our church. The Lord be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.